So the topic was leveraging relationships in order to maximize performance and profitability. So I thought, well, you're an alliance. I mean, if it's not about relationships, what on earth would it be about? So that was a pretty straightforward assignment. But as I began to kind of prepare for you, I came across an article written by Dean almost a year ago, I guess. And here's what he said. He was talking about the power of associations and about coming together like you're coming together. But he said this. He said the purpose of a, some kind of an association or an alliance is that it, it's to cause you to look at your firms differently. Well, that's kind of stopped me up short. That means I can't kind of do the usual thing about relationships. You have to have a common goal. You have to communicate, et cetera, et cetera. Talks that you have probably heard a thousand times. So we got to do something different. Well, Dean triggered my remembrance of my favorite Buckminster Fuller quote, and he said this. He says, you can't change existing reality. All you can do is create some new model so dramatic, so powerful, people forget what the old model is like. So then the challenge becomes, all right, so we can't approach relationships in the same old way, and we've got to create something totally new for a new age. How on earth do we do that? And that is our challenge. So with all respect, I want to kind of redefine the topic because we have to redefine our relationships. I'm of this opinion that the kind of relationships that most of us have cut our teeth on that we've built up over the years simply aren't doing it anymore. We have to find a totally new way of relating to clients and relating to each other. There has got to be another approach that we're not quite tapping into yet. And it's that approach that I'd like to take a little bit of time this morning to talk to you about. Let me kind of explain a little bit about how we need to get into this. From the moment you were born, some people think even before that, but that gets weird. From the moment you took your first breath, you became, you, you developed an agreement with the universe. So an infant who cries and gets something in response says, whoa, did you, did you notice that? I do this, she does that. Pretty cool. And the kids are trying to figure out, what can I do to bring different sorts of responses from my mother and my father? And there are times as a frustrated parent, your child is crying or whining or something, and you don't know what she wants. The kid's just trying out stuff. We form an agreement with the universe. We literally became, become, we walk around like this. This is how the world works. This is how I understand things to be. And within that framework, you see, we have all the stuff of life. We develop our beliefs and our assumptions and our behaviors, but we think it's like this. This is how it works. And we become so convinced about that that we literally hardwire that perspective into our brains. We have figured it out. And we have all kinds of things in our minds that are simply stable and set. They are firm. There's only one way to barbecue baby back ribs. And I have it. And if you have another approach, I'm sorry, it is wrong. You can chat with me afterwards. I will correct your approach to barbecue baby back ribs. We know how the world is to function. Now, Within our frame of reference, we have what we call the adjacent options because the truth is nobody in this room is going to say, I resist change. We don't resist change. We know other people who do. Names are coming into your mind right now. But it's not us. Now, what we really mean when we say, I don't resist change, we mean I am open to adjacent options. If you sat at the back this morning, maybe you'll sit at the front tomorrow. You say, see, I change. Oh, come on. Right? That's not change. You tried sushi for the first time. Look at how open I am. Oh, give me a break. That's not, you know, that's nothing more than what's in here. Right? And so we bounce around within our parameters, our worldview, and we think we are in fact changing. But the fact is, outside of how we see the world is what's called the impossible. The things that you don't quite get, that you don't quite believe, that you don't quite understand. And that's another whole realm out there. These are the non-adjacent options. These are the approaches, these are the possibilities, these are the solutions that are not even in our frame of reference. Now here's what's kind of interesting. The solution to every problem that we have is within our frame of reference or outside of our frame of reference. What do you think? It's outside of our frame of reference. If it was in our frame of reference, we would have done it. We wouldn't have the problem, would we? 
In other words, every challenge that we are facing today requires input from us, it requires insight from us that is currently outside of the way we are thinking. This is why we've got to begin redefining who we are, beginning to see the world in a different way because the solutions we most need are not part of our normal discourse. They're not part of our normal way of thinking. They're outside of it. So in my definition, change happens within your worldview. Transformation happens outside of your worldview. My good friend Daniel Burr is probably, in, for my money, the, the greatest technology forecaster on the planet today. He said this. He said, the greatest danger facing organizations today is they'll change, but they won't transform. I don't think the world tolerates change any longer. We haven't got time for change. If all we're going to do is change, don't bother. It isn't worth it. So how do we then we approach relationships in a way that breaks these bounds? How do we approach relationships in a way that looks at the non-adjacent options? You ever use that phrase, let's think outside the box? Usually we use that phrase when we're in trouble. We can't come up with a solution through the normal way, so somebody says, wait, well, let's think outside the box. It's a funny phrase when you stop and think about it, because what were you doing before you were thinking outside the box? Well, I was thinking in the box. Was that working for you? No. Furthermore, once you're finished thinking outside the box, where do you have to go? Talk to me. Back in the box. Well, what was the point of that? And who put the box there in the first place? Here's my conclusion. As long as you can even see a box, you're not thinking outside of it. There is no real freedom in that kind of perspective. That's like taking a prisoner out of his cell and putting him into the exercise yard. He runs around saying, I'm free, I'm free. No, you're not. You're going back in in a minute. So this thinking outside the box is pointless in this day and age. We've got to learn how to think without a box. How on earth do we do that. That is our challenge today. You know, on Thursday, not a word of a lie, this past Thursday, I get this, art, this newsletter, and the, and the article is about, is creativity a bad trait for a senior leader? I said, what? And the article literally says, thinking outside the box could keep you out of top management. I, I'm thinking, what has gone wrong with our world? Where to be a senior leader, you have got to protect the status quo. You can't do anything imaginative. You can't take any kind of risk. What kind of leader is that? Here's an article on strategy and business saying that's what business wants. Fortunately, toward the end of the article, somebody added, well, unless you're supposed to be a transformational leader. Well, excuse me. If we are not transforming the lives of our clients, if we are not transforming our business, I don't think we have any relevancy. I was just shocked at this kind of a position, that somehow we were to be afraid of people who challenge things and test things and change their minds and see things differently. You, you've been, I'm, I'm a, I have a dual citizenship now, but I was originally a Canadian, and I'm proud to have the U.S. citizenship, but I'm still getting used to the U.S. political situation. Is anybody else still working on that and you were born here? <laughs> One of the things that gets me is they'll interview somebody and they'll say to him, you've seen this on Meet the Press and programs, let me show you something you said in 1983, boom, up it goes. Today you said something different, as though that were wrong. It's been 25 years. Maybe they've changed their minds. Maybe they have grown. Maybe they see things differently now. But in somehow in our society, we think that's a bad thing, that you only have one thought and that's it forever. You have to keep the status quo going. Gang, we've got to get rid of that kind of thinking or we're going to be in big, big trouble. We're meant to be transforming. We're meant to be living organisms, constantly changing and dancing to the universe. Boy, that got me, that article colleague of mine, Dr. John Finney, lays out our challenge in this way from a kind of historical perspective. He, he talks about the waves of change all the way from the hunter-gatherer days through agriculture and the industrial age, the information age, and so on. And, and, and I, I want to talk a little bit about this because understanding the context in which we need to form relationships is really pretty critical. 
So let me kind of give you some definitions. Would you agree with me that most of us sort of regard ourselves as kind of in the information age? Is that not kind of language that we have been using for quite a while now? And I define the information age this way. It's the ability to explain current reality based on factual information. It's having factual information. Now, I don't know how much of your professional time is spent doing information-related things. I would bet a fair bit. People want explanations. Can I do this? What about that? How did that happen? And we try to explain them based on our expertise. Well, according to the chart, we can kind of elevate that a little bit to knowledge, and knowledge is a little different. Knowledge is the skill of using that information to change current reality. So you use your information, but you use the information to change the reality of a situation for your clients or for yourselves. But we can go above that again. Right? I don't know how much of your time is spent on knowledge-related interventions, but we can go up to wisdom. Now, wisdom is where it starts kind of getting into the rare air. Wisdom is the insight to see possibilities other people can't see and to turn those things, those possibilities, into a whole new reality. So here's actually the challenge, and this will sound flip to you, but I don't mean it in that way. I think the client should leave your office having met with you saying, I heard wisdom today. You just didn't explain a tax situation. You didn't just say what I might be able to do. You actually gave me wisdom. So those three areas of information, knowledge, and wisdom really become the mix of what you and I do. I happen to think there's a world above even wisdom, and I call that the energetic world. This is the level, and I'm going to get into this a little bit if I have the nerve. This is, the, this is the aspect where we get into how does this universe really function and are we missing something? This is where the quantum people you know, have some real insights for us in terms of good, practical, profitable business. So I want to give you a taste of that. I hope that you will find it interesting. The energetic world. Here's my observation. Not about you, but about, about the businesses that I tend to hang out in. Most businesses tend to serve people on the information level still. What is not happening is re the realization that what people are really looking for is way beyond information. They're looking for wisdom. This is a big problem facing the medical community right now. The moment you have anything wrong with you, what's the first thing you do? Call your doctor or what? You Google it. And we're rapidly coming to the point where doctors, by and large, aren't all that necessary because I'm getting the information other places. Only if it gets really complex or something, then do you have to kind of develop that relationship. Do you see what I'm saying to you? In virtually every profession, the information level is being handled on a different, in a different way. We don't need you for information. We need you for knowledge and wisdom. And that gap, that gap is not being crossed in most professional situations. That's where the restlessness is coming in in this day and age. This is why we have all the angst around us. I mean, everybody just seems so tense and irritable and upset. And it's because of this gap that we're not filling. I'm of this impression that if you folks, if this alliance could get their arms around that gap, you will own your world. Because I don't think anybody else does. I was reminded, did even accountants have to take Psych 101? Did you have to take Psych 101? No? Come on, it was easy. Okay. I'm a psychologist, so I, I bow at names like Abraham Maslow. Right? But he said this, he said, the unease and unrest in the world is caused by people living far below their capacity. In my language, it's people living far below their possibilities. When there is a gap between what you're doing with your life and what you could do with your life, you cannot help but be unhappy. You cannot help but feel that kind of tension. There's something in your DNA that says, there's more, there's more, you could do this. And that's true organizationally as well. 
There will always be a restlessness of spirit when we are not truly fulfilling our ultimate possibilities. If you know in your heart we could do better, we could have higher levels of performance, we could have higher levels of profitability, of innovation, would you sense that in your soul, even if you don't know how to do it, you feel that tension. You feel the tension. We know, we know there is so much more for this alliance. It's been pretty impressive so far because I read the history of it. I saw all the dots, see, and it's pretty amazing. All right, so here you are. What do you think is possible? What could we do if we could just find that secret ingredient? What's missing in that gap? What could we do in our world? So here's how possibilities work. As you sit there, your life is literally filled with... You, you don't even want to know how many possibilities there are in your life. You don't even want to know. Possibilities have been coming in and out of your life. You don't even recognize most of them. We act on even fewer. Just a simple act of where did you want to sit this morning had enormous possibilities. You picked one out of thousands and thousands of them in, in this room alone. Let me demonstrate this thing to you. Right? You're going to have a uh, Christmas party at your house. Thirteen staff members are coming over. All right? You've got a nice big long buffet table there. How many different ways could those 13 people sit at your buffet table? What would your guess be? I'll give you the answer because you won't figure it out. The answer is over six billion ways. Those 13 people could be arranged around that table. This is why when people say, where do you want us to sit? You say, anywhere. <laughs> Otherwise, it just takes way too much time to figure it out. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? The possibilities in our lives, folks, are absolutely breathtakingly enormous. So here's what happens to us. What typically happens is we look at our environment and we say, okay, we're, let's, it's time to do our strategic plan again. So what do you think we ought to do? What kind of targets we ought to set? And we pick one. By definition, as I said earlier, we typically pick an adjacent option, right? We pick something that will sort of satisfy people, but will still kind of minimize some risk, and, and it'll, it, it's almost guaranteed that we can do it, and, and, and so on, right? That's what we pick. What we don't stop to think very often is, wait a minute, you picked number 76, you could have had number 12,677. That's a non-adjacent option. But see, instead of looking around saying, well, what's the industry doing? Well, the industry is doing 6.5, so why don't we try for 6.5 or 6.7? Or, see, that's how we think. We think of what can, we, what can we just do within our parameters here instead of saying, what is possible? How do we learn to reach higher than that? Let me give you an example from a real-life client just about three, four months ago. This is a company that uh, does uh, finance in, in the agricultural uh, sector. Right? And these, these are their 10 strategies. Most of them don't just, I just put them up there, right? There's a couple there with an actual number on it, 40% crop insurance share. I thought that was kind of interesting. Now, they don't want 100%. I understand that because if all the crops are wiped out, they're in trouble, right? So they don't want all that market. But I don't know. How did they pick 40%? What kind of meeting was that? Like, why couldn't they go like 41? I said to them, who do you want to have the 60%? They didn't see any humor in that at all. But the one that's interesting is the client satisfaction. You guys do this, right? It's going to be, they, their aim is 1.40 client satisfaction. They are deliberately planning to annoy somebody. <laughs> it's on a five-point scale. Now, what kind of meeting produced that number? 1.4. Could you not like, try for a 1.5? You know, a three, rather. Something. Why, why 1.4? Because if one is perfect client satisfaction, they couldn't ever put that down because it is what? Impossible. Says who? Why could you not? Is there no reason on earth that that one customer that you annoyed couldn't have been serviced better? Well, yes, we could have. Then you could have had perfect, couldn't you? You could have been a one. See, this is how we think. We think about what can we get away with, what's doable, instead of what is possible. This is a huge mindset change that I really want to encourage you to think about. Stop solving problems and start thinking about possibilities. It totally will transform how you do your business. Now on the website, which is a very good website by the way, 
I thought this was kind of interesting. Right? This is how the, you folks approach your clients. What you want to do is understand, truly understand your clients, their business, their aspirations, and their challenges. And then once you understand where the client's at, then you can help and intervene with your insights and your skills and, and so forth. But then I step back in light of what I'm trying to say to you, and I'm thinking, all right, now, just a second here. Now, gang, I'm just putting this out as a thought, all right? I have no right. Nobody's asked me for my opinion. It's just a thought for you to think about. When you talk about their business, their aspirations, and their challenges, is that inside their frame of reference or outside their frame of reference? Talk to me. It's inside their frame of reference. This is my whole point. The alliance that will own the world is one that doesn't just work within the parameters of your client. It's the one that begins to break open the parameters of your client. If you ever feel the inclination to do, redo this page, I would encourage you to think about adding this and their possibilities. Because your clients don't even see their possibilities. That's your job from outside of their worldview is to show them, hey, did you know, what about this? Why couldn't we do that? What about this? I don't know how that's going over, but it seems to me that's what the world's looking for. Show me my possibilities. Don't just solve my problems. I'm telling you, folks, that will transform the brand. It will transform this alliance. It will transform these relationships. Show me what is possible. Because let's face it, can we be, be real, have brutal truth here? Unfortunately, the legacy of the finance industry is not about possibilities. It's what you can't do. Isn't that true? Nobody says, I need some excitement. I'm going to visit my accountant. Hmm? <laughs> but why not? Why not? Why can't, I'm sure, and I'm sure that happens in this room. But, but why can't we be the ones that they, they just get, every time they see us, they get exhilarated because we open up a whole new world for them. Focus on possibilities. Why couldn't you be the alliance of possibilities? If you know, as we say to the clients, you know, the potential clients in our world, if you know that you could fly higher than anyone else, you come here for the help to do that. We will 